Thanks so much. Thanks so much. And thank you to uh, uh, our colleagues from Washington for the warm fuzzies. Um, it was like a Winnie the Pooh book, right? It was, we were just bathed in good feeling and all this optimism. Winnie the Pooh goes to Washington, and Tigger and, uh, and Piglet form a super committee. And, um, but no, it's important work, and it's essential to the, to the work that, that obviously you all do, but also to, to making um, the inroads where, where so much of, of what um, I work on and, and think about in terms of uh, healthcare and technology is um, bathed in optimism. Um, there is a, a, an essentially pragmatic uh, aspect of all this, and that, that is the important thing about um, what goes on in Washington and the important thing about what all of you do as well. Um, I, should, I should pause to thank you for coming to San Francisco, uh, where, where, uh, where we're based at here at Wired. We're just down the street. Um, and where the party is always on because, you know, the fog machines are always running. Um, so uh, so we, we turn those on just for you. Um, the one thing about this neighborhood that, that you may or may not have gleaned is it actually is something of the hub of the technology uh, industry um, in, in San Francisco. Um, Twitter is just actually around the corner now. They just moved on to Market Street. Um, Zynga, the, the game company, is, is just down, uh, down on 7th Street. Uh, and Instagram is a block and a half away. They just got acquired, acquired for, by, for a billion dollars by Facebook. So, so you're really at, and, and Wired is just a block and a half away as well. So, so you're at this, this, this epicenter of, of technology and innovation. And for us, it's, it's this, um, uh, we're very, we feel very fortunate to be part of it and to be, to be kind of soaking it up all the time. Um, the potential uh, of applying that to healthcare is something that, that uh, five years ago, uh, five, six years ago, was, was not really on anybody's mind around here. Um, but that's changed radically and dramatically over the past few years. Uh, it's, it's become a real target for a lot of innovation. A lot of these, these same people are looking at healthcare and thinking, what is the opportunity there? What are the opportunities? Um, and so I just wanted to talk to you today about some of those ideas. Um, and some of those, some of those potentials, and, and try to get it, uh, get at how they might be relevant to to the organizations uh, that you're responsible for. Um, now, this this phrase is personalized medicine. I when I, I'm, I when I refer to personalized medicine, I'm not talking about um, drug medicine that involves drugs tailored to individuals. That's part of it. But really, what I'm concerned in about and interested in is personalized medicine uh, defined as data. Um, drawn from uh, all sorts of resources, data that's been tailored to the individual, and that data helps guide better clinical decisions, better care decisions, better treatment. Sometimes that involves drugs, but not essentially. Um, but it's data, not drugs. And I might be fighting a losing battle in, in my redefinition of personalized medicine along those lines, but, but so be it. Um, that's, what, that's what I mean by it. Um, I want to start, though, with a, um, let me turn this on. I want to start with a, a story about this fellow, Archie Cochran. Um, Archie Cochran was, as you might be able to date from the photo, was a, um, a physician, a uh, Scottish physician, in, in, uh, when this photo was taken in the 40s. Uh, and the story I want to tell involves him um, as a uh, physician, but also as a prisoner of war in, in a German prison camp. He was, he, uh, was on, a member of the uh, British Army, but was captured. and. Uh, was put in a uh, prison with 8,000 British soldiers. And he was the sole medical provider for those 8,000 um, soldiers. So uh, if you think your organizations are stretched in terms of resources, think about what, what Archie Cochran was dealing with. Um, he had some aspirin um, and some, uh, I think some solve, some, some, uh, some ointments, but that was pretty much it. Um, and he was faced with diphtheria, he was faced with dysentery, um, tuberculosis was, was rife. Um, it was quite, quite a challenge. And uh, he got very little support, um, no support at all from the Germans. In fact, the German um, guards were, would grow, had grown so bored that they would take to firing into the um, British camp for, uh, the prison camp for sport. So they would just they'd shoot at random um, in, among the prisoners. Um, and then it was Dr. Cochrane's uh, duty to care for those patient, patients as well. Um, one, at one point, uh, Archie had a, a situation where he had a, a growing sense that malnutrition was a huge problem in the, in the uh, 
among the prisoners. They, they were not fed nearly as much as they needed. And, uh, and so they started to um, have some, some odd effects. They started to have edema in their, in their uh, ankles and their, um, their legs. They would have swelling and, and swelling sores. Um, and Dr. Cochran didn't know what to do about it. He had no idea uh, how to treat it. But he was a resourceful guy, and he decided that he was going to perform an experiment. So he got himself um, on the black market. He got himself some Marmite. Um, do you all know what Marmite is? It's that uh, British kind of, n n well, I was going to say nasty. I shouldn't say nasty. An acquired taste. Um, and it's an acquired taste. It's a, it's a yeasty spread is what it is. Um, and it has, but it's packed with vitamins, especially, um, in fact, B12. Um, and so he, he had the Marmite, and he had some vitamin C uh, pills that he had also acquired um, on the black market. And he got 20 patients, or actually 40 patients, divided them up into two groups of 20, and decided to perform a little experiment to see if he could help these patients with their edema, their, their swelling. And I should mention, he had it too. He was also suffering from this condition. So he had a vested interest in trying to figure out how to treat this ailment. So he ran the course for a few, a few days, a couple weeks, and uh, lo and behold, the, the, actually not even a couple weeks, because within a few days, it was pretty clear that uh, the patients on the, using the Marmite, getting the, the, what amounted to a B12 supplement, um, started to get better quite rapidly. Uh, and so, so he, had, he had his evidence, and he went to the Germans, he went to the German um, uh, commanders of the prison camp, and he presented his evidence, he presented his charts, and uh, they went away, and he thought nothing would come of it. Um, but lo and behold, a few days later, there was cases of Marmite for his prisoners. And uh, so Dr. Cochran start, began treating all 8,000 prisoners uh, under his care with Marmite, and uh, edema was one less affliction that they were faced with in the prison camp. Um, Dr. Cochran calls it, or called it, his, his first, worst, and most successful trial ever. Um, Dr. Cochran went on to be the real pioneer of randomized clinical trials. He was the fellow who made, who brought um, the, the kind of uh, function of science, the rigorous experimentation of an RCT to medicine. Uh, he, was, he was profoundly upset throughout his career. He was a great, he was a physician and went on to become an epidemiologist, but he was always annoyed by how poor the connection was between what doctors did and the evidence that they had for doing it, um, doctors, other care providers. He wanted to be sure that the care, the, the limited resource of, of care was actually always based in scientific evidence. And he, he insisted on scientific evidence. He insisted on the rigor of the best possible science before you apply your resources, before you tax your system. And that for him was all about RCTs. Uh, which was, if you can imagine, in the 40s, 50s, 60s, even in the 70s, even in the 80s, was not the way medicine was always delivered, right? It was this, this other way where people seemed to, they thought they knew what they were doing, that's the way they were told to do it. Uh, that was really, that received knowledge was extremely hard to challenge with, with evidence. Uh, but it was Dr. Cochran's task and his mission in life to do that. Um, that mission culminated in, in uh, the book that he wrote, a little pamphlet that actually he wrote most of it in three hours, um, but it became and, and still resonates as one of the, one of the um, kind of key texts of modern medicine, uh, Effectiveness and Efficiency, he titled it. Um, and the whole key to, to uh, a, a engaged, um, smart delivery of medicine for him was to measure the effect of a particular medical action in altering the nat natural history of disease for the better, right? So it was all about measuring an action in order to, to ascertain whether it was actually making things better, which of course is what we all want to do with healthcare, right? That's the goal. You want to make things better, but you want to be sure you're actually doing it in the most efficient, efficient effective way. And again, in 1971, that was an incredibly radical notion. He was going up against the National Health Service in England. He was, he was um, fed up with it. Uh, and he put this pamphlet out there as a, as a kind of um, uh, really burying his chest. And as I say, it resonated so much that it, it started to make inroads, not just um, at the NHS, but also here in the United States and other countries. And it was the advent of what would become uh, evidence-based medicine. So measuring the effect to see if we could improve disease 
uh, or change disease for the better. That's a great principle, right? That's the principle on which we really um, have, have based the medical system today. The, the kind of much of the health reform that we were just hearing about is based on that principle that, that with better measurement, um, with better application of, of quantification methods, we can, we can improve the way we deliver health care. But I think we're at this moment where we can actually take a huge leap forward in the way we do that. The huge leap forward in taking the principles, the philosophy of people like Archie Cochran and really propelling them a whole generation ahead. Um, I think we can use these technologies, these tools that are going around, um, that are being developed around here, um, being developed elsewhere in, in the US and, and other countries, and really move the dial on healthcare. And I think it can happen first at, at institutions such as your own. So what does that look like? Well, it starts with this great similarity. It starts with this great kind of um, uh, parallel uh, vocabulary that, that medicine and healthcare have with technology, and it's all about scale, right? This is, it was drilled into me in public health school. If you can't reach big populations, if you can't make an effect on a population, you're not really moving the dial. Right? Clinical, clinical care is, is, is all well and good. I have these arguments with my sister, the surgeon, um, all the time um, until I finally convinced her to go to public health school as well. And so now she's, she's got the religion of population. She's got the religion of scale, um, uh, which for a surgeon, as you may know, is a little unconventional. But, um, but this is the same thing. This is the same obsession, the same fascination that, is, that um, underlies so much of technological innovation over the last 30, 40, 50 years. Scale, economies of scale, working at, at scale, is the foundation of the information technology revolution. Now, that's not the kind of technologies that typically pop up in healthcare, right? When, when you think about technology in healthcare, you think about MRIs, you think about CT scans, you think about all about these fancy and really expensive technologies. And do they make costs lower? Do they drive costs down? No, they add costs, right? Healthcare is this, has been, has been, is not, does, is not only this way uh, yet still, but it has been this weird kind of alternate universe, bizarro land, where technology makes things more expensive. It doesn't work that way in the rest of the world. In the rest of the world, technology makes things cheaper because you're working on economies of scale. Now let me point out just a, a few of the, the specifics here. In healthcare, when I'm talking about scalable technologies, I'm not talking about CT scans, I'm talking about public sanitation. Right? That's a scalable technology. That's a technology that once it was implemented, once it was brought to our cities, you were changing millions of people's lives, changing billions of people's lives. Sanitation, indoor plumbing, that's an amazing technology. Vaccination, immunization, another scalable technology, perhaps the first biotechnology, um, but a technology that, that is easily distributed to millions of people and you're able to save millions of people's lives. That is scalable technology brought to healthcare. And, and the most kind of profound example is, is um, agriculture and, and uh, just uh, farming, right? So, so um, husbandry is an amazing scale, the, uh, or amazing technology. The plow is, has been an amazing uh, technology. The Green Revolution um, has, is, was the application of uh, uh, mechanical technologies, chemical technologies, that all of a sudden made it possible to feed millions of people who were not getting a full, a full uh, nutrition uh, uh, kind of component of nutrition before. That was an amazing shift in our, in our, the way we, in our, in our population, our overall global population. Those are scalable technologies brought to healthcare. So what are the next ones? The next ones, I think, this other age is where we start using what is the same technologies that have changed um, the, the computer age, the computer um, industries, and so much there. It starts with this graph, um, this, this incredibly boring graph from 1965. Um, it was actually written by a fellow named Gordon Moore, um, who uh, you may have heard of his, uh, the law that emerged from this graph, Moore's Law. Um, this was simply, um, in 1965, he, he wrote down five points of data five years where um, he was seeing how fast a computer chip worked. So, so what was the speed of the chip? Um, and he noticed that there was this very steady progression, the thing that chips were getting cheaper and faster and better on a logarithmic scale right here. And he thought it was going to go all the way to 1975, right? Well, it turns out that that line has gone all the way to today, and it's expected to go 
on and on and on. It's actually expected to go for, for decades hence. That's because this, this power of, of improving computing processing is, is, uh, has always gotten better. Somebody in some lab somewhere, Gordon Moore didn't know who, but somebody in some lab somewhere was going to figure out a way to get a little bit more power out of a chip. And that's happened again and again. An engineer in some lab in Intel, um, in, at, at uh, 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 ARM, uh, any number of these chip fabs, they're all racing to make a slightly better chip. And they get, get there, and that same line has continued to go. So that's computing speed, right? That's processing power. That's what gives us better computers, faster computers every year. The second kind of uh, linchpin of, of uh, the computer revolution is this, is storage space. So it's great to get faster computers, but you also get larger hard drives, right? You get larger hard drives when you buy a computer. Um, and the best way to illustrate that is, is the iPod. Um, the iPod, not the iPhone. Remember the iPod, the, the, the device that only played music? Um, when it came 11 years ago in 2001, it was this amazing device, right? It changed the music industry, it changed so many lives because you could fit hold on to your hats, a thousand songs in your pocket. Can you imagine that? It was a thousand songs. Um, now, of course, the, the amount of, of storage space that you get when you buy an iPod, you can still buy an iPod. Um, you can go on the Apple, tunes, Apple store and, and just buy a plain old iPod. It's called the iPod Classic. Um, if you're, if, uh, it's 160 gigabytes compared to five gigabytes, and it costs $250 instead of $400. That's, uh, I believe, a 19-fold increase in the, the um, size per dollar um, uh, scale. And, and this is just one example of how storage space has changed um, computing. The cloud revolution is all about the same thing, right? So when, when this, whole, this whole advent of cloud-based storage, that's all because storage space, storage um, uh, capacity has gotten so cheap, it's basically free. And so people can give it away. Um, that's, the, that's the kind of miracle of Amazon. Amazon, really, their, their big business these days is not selling books, it's not selling retail, it's storage space. Amazon Web Services is this, is this incredibly powerful part of the business, and it runs some of the most powerful companies um, on the internet. Netflix is actually run on Amazon servers because they've, they've uh, contracted, they've, they saw this storage space revolution going on and decided that they were gonna start selling it uh, for cheap. So that's the second part, right? Processing power, storage space. And then this third bit, which is probably less familiar to you, is sensors. The, the advent of cheap sensors is the, the kind of third and, and most uh, kind of imminent shift in technological innovation. It starts with um, a device like this, an accelerometer. So a sensor is just something that picks up data and detects it and quantifies it and then can transmit it to someplace else, okay? So that's what a sensor is. Um, uh, an accelerometer measures movement. So it measures movement in a uh, few directions, up, down, side to side, back, forward. Uh, in 1966, the only people who needed accelerometers were the US military, right? Or maybe the Soviet military as well. Um, let's say, just say the military. Um, but they could afford $100,000 for a sensor, like an accelerometer, and they needed it because they wanted to turn their rockets that they would just shoot off, they wanted to turn them into guided missiles. But in order to guide a missile, they needed to know where the missile was, and they needed the missile to know where it was. And the tool for that is an accelerometer. So you spend $100,000, you put it in an ICBM, and boom, you've got it a guided missile. Well, today, the cost of an accelerometer has gotten to be less than a dollar, um, and they've shrunk from about this size to, to uh, less than a thumbnail, um, and they're everywhere. Accelerometers are everywhere. I've got, I've got two on me right now. I've got one on my phone, I've got one on my wrist. Um, you all, if you have a smartphone on you, you have an accelerometer on you. In fact, if you have a, a smartphone on you, you have at least this many accelerometers, uh, or um, this many sensors. So there are, there are uh, at least half a dozen uh, sensors packed into every phone that exists right now. And all of these things have the capacity to gather data. In fact, the smartphone, in, just as a device, is, is a, a, the best indicator of all three of these trends. Processing power, storage space, and sensors. That phone that you have, that I have, um, has more computing power than uh, the state-of-the-art $3,000, $5,000, $10,000 laptop that you could get 15 years ago. That phone, 
that you buy for, for two, three hundred dollars and, and sign up for a service plan and you don't even think of it as a computer is a computer that would blow people away in 1995. And it's all because of these shifts, these economies of scale. These scales, these, these amazing things have kicked in and changed the way we think about our, what we can do. All, the, all, the things that they make it, all these things that make it possible to, to, change, to listen to music, all the way, these, these, um, way they've changed the way we live our lives, it's great. And now all those changes, all those same trajectories are coming to healthcare. So um, this all kind of feeds back to data. Right? So, so all of that accelerometer, all those sensors are gathering data. All that data is going to um, storage centers like this one. This is Facebook's storage center, one of their data centers. Um, uh, that's the storage space. And then there's the processing power that churns through this data and tries to get some meaning out of it. And this is an amazing moment. This is where we're, we're in this data age. You've, you've probably heard the phrase, actually, if you, when you go through the San Francisco airport, you'll see the uh, signs all over the place for advertising for big data. Um, there, there are companies that are selling the services for big data anal analytics. And it's because of these servers. It's because of the power of people to collect information very easily and analyze it very readily and cheaply. So you put all that together and you get something like this. So that's, that's the back end. This is the front end. I want to tell you about something called um, A-B testing. Okay? So, so when you um, go onto a website, when you go onto uh, Amazon or Yahoo or Google, um, the page that you're looking at is different than the page that I'm looking at or that somebody else at your table may be looking at. Not because it's been personalized or anything, but because all of those companies are constantly doing testing. They're constantly experimenting with what uh, is the optimal interface. What is, that, what is the best possible way to design the website so that it gets you to either add something to the cart or click here. So you might see, some of you might see a button, say, say that says add to cart, and then the rest of you might see, half of you might see add to cart, half of you might see something that says click here. And the company, the, the Amazon on the other end, is monitoring which button has a better response rate, right? So 80% so of us might see add to cart and we, we actually click that. Um, or I'm sorry, 80%, say half of us have the add to cart, 80% of that half might click on add to cart where, where only 30% of the half that sees click here might hit that button. So there's something about the little blue circle there and the, the words add to cart that, that gets us, that entices us to click the button a little more commonly, a little more readily. That's called A-B testing, and it's going on constantly on the web. The web is an environment of constant experimentation. It's constant measurement. It's constant quantification. Archie Cochran would love A-B testing. It's this, it's this environment in which everything is data and everything is possible to be analyzed. Every reaction is an experiment. Every, every possible interaction with a consumer is an, is an opportunity to create an experiment and to learn something and to improve the interface. Now, if you're, if you're Amazon, the improvement is to get people to buy more books or buy more uh, uh, com computer cables or something like that. But imagine what happens if you start taking this methodology, if you start taking this power of analytics and bringing it to something like, like healthcare. If you start taking this ability to instantly use um, data analytics for, for all, on, on all sorts of kind of uh, uh, huge populations, huge data sets, and measure in real time what people are doing. The power here is that it overcomes what is called the hippo problem. And the hippo problem looks like this. Um, now, some of you in this room are hippos. Um, and what I'm talking about is, is uh, just to be clear, I'm not insulting your, your, your uh, physical demeanor. Hippo stands for highest paid person's opinion. All right? So if you are the highest paid person and you have an opinion, that's, you're the hippo in the room, right? And so in many organizations, many of your organizations, there is such a thing as the HIPPO rule. And the HIPPO rule is, is whatever the highest paid person's opinion is, that's what the decision is, right? That may or may not be in response to the data. That may or may not actually have anything to do with what the best answer is, what the actual data shows. So A-B testing is the antithesis of the HIPPO rule. A-B testing is a way where you're taking the, the opinion of somebody um, the opinion of the person who happens to be the highest paid person. And you're, ta you're taking that out of the equation and you're letting the data make the decision. 
So this is, this is this profound shift that, is, that has really changed the nature of technology companies in many ways because there might be somebody who's responsible for implementing a procedure, but it's not necessarily their, their opinion that is going to determine what that procedure is. It's the data. It's the test. All of this is in creating, in effect, a feedback loop. It's a constant environment of feedback. It's an environment of feedback where, where any bit of um, uh, data that's collected is an ability, to, is an opportunity to shift a, a environment, shift um, a service, make an improvement, make an adjustment based on data. It's an uh, environment in which you can actually start tailoring information to people based on the data. You can start tailoring environments to people based on what makes them individually respond a little better. And that's where we start to get closer to healthcare. Because in healthcare, so much of what we want to do is to start getting people to make slightly different decisions. We want to get people to make slightly better decisions, decisions that, that actually improve their own lives, improve their own health. And we can do that. We can be more persuasive when we're doing it based on data. So, so let me show you a couple examples of, of how this works. I want to show you two different data sets. So I want to go through um, two different kind of sets of data, uh, two different places where, where data is emerging. And the first is new data, what, what um, this kind of opportunity to use sensors, use accelerometers, use all this kind of infrastructure of, of new uh, technology to create and collect data that, that wasn't being captured before. Um, there's a horrible term in technology called data exhaust. And basically, we're all emitting data exhaust every day um, as we go through our, uh, the web, as we, as we decide where we're going to drive um, and uh, what route we're going to take on the GPS. Um, we're, we're leaving a trail of data. And capturing that data, capturing that data exhaust is um, a huge opportunity for improving people's decisions and improving um, their services. So, so that's all new data. And uh, the best example I have for this one is, is this scale called the Withing Scale. This is, it looks like an ordinary scale. Does anybody have one of these scales? So, oh good, okay. Well, I won't make you, I won't, I'll, I'll use myself as a guinea pig. I won't use you as a guinea pig. But the Withing scale is a scale that is most famous because it tweets what you weigh, all right? So you step on the scale and it, it, it will send it up to Twitter. Um, you can turn that off. You can, you can adjust the preferences. Uh, but it will send, your, it will send your, your weight not just to Twitter, but it will also send it to a cloud, uh, the cloud storage, where um, you can uh, retrieve your, your weight and status on the internet, on the web, and it looks like this. This is, um, this is my, uh, my results over the last uh, year or so, almost two years actually, um, that I've had this scale. Um, you see I've had my downs and my ups. Um, so when I got the scale, I was 159 pounds, and I went on this big drive uh, to get back to my college weight of 150. And, and for one glorious day in September of last year, <laughs> I hit it. That felt good. Um, and then I don't know what happened. Uh, I mean, I got this, uh, this other thing, I'm, the other accelerometer I'm wearing is, an, is called the Nike Fuel Band. It's this new thing from Nike, and, it, and it, uh, uh, I've had it for a couple of months, and it gets, gets you to move to a certain amount, and you gather points. Um, right now I have um, 1,000 points, 1,027 points. Um, and I want to get, a, I want, my goal is 3,000 points. It's just, what are the points? It's, it's this Nike proprietary number. It doesn't mean anything. But it's a number, and I try to get to that number. Um, so I'm, I'm mentioning this to, to kind of compensate for the fact that my, even though my weight is going up, um, somehow I'm really moving a lot uh, because of this. <laughs> Be that as it may, I feel like I'm doing pretty OK. Um, but this is a way to understand where I uh, where I'm, am in a way that, that I was not really conscious of before I started tracking. I mean, it's, it's amazing how, how resonant this is for me now. And, and I'll be the first to admit, I don't really have any issues with, with weight. So for me, it's not, it's, it's not, a, it's not a, a, a pressing concern. Um, if, I'm, if I'm 157, 158, that's, that's still well within a healthy weight for me. Um, but it's fascinating for me to try to get, to try to be where I want to be and to use this to, to drive my choices and to use this to drive my choices. So, so um, it's, a, it's a constant mode of awareness where I'm aware of what I'm doing and I'm aware of how the smaller decisions I make filter in to this, uh, this larger and aggregate to become this larger 
uh, board. Uh, to give you another sense of it, this is my five-year-old's um, weight. Um, the scale recognizes him what, uh, when he steps on it versus me, um, versus my wife, versus our other, uh, our other boy. And so for, for the last two years, or the last year and a half, we were on this mission to get him to 40 pounds. Because uh, at 40 pounds, he could get into a booster seat. And, and so for, for so long, we were getting, he was getting on that scale, and really, we thought we'd get to 40 pounds right away, and it just took him forever. Um, and you'll see just last week, he crossed the threshold to 40.9 pounds. So he's now in a booster seat and so happy. Um, but for him, two, two things to note out of this. One is, for him, this was, this was uh, driving him towards a goal, or it was helping him see how, where he was in terms of um, part of, part of uh, you know, how it affected his eating. And it, it was kind of something we, we would talk about occasionally at the dinner table to get him to actually eat a little bit, um, little bit more. But it's also the environment in which he's growing up. Right? So he's five years old, and, and this is normal for him. Now, we're not a high-tech, even though I work at Wired and all that, we're not really a high-tech uh, uh, household. We don't have a television. We don't, we don't play video games. Um, this, is, this is pretty much the only exposure he gets to, to a screen. Um, and, and it's normal for him. He's very kind of used to the fact that when he steps on that scale, there's going to be this change in a, in a uh, log chart someplace. I think that's going to be a very interesting generation to see what, what they start to do when they, get, um, when they get to full age. So that's one example. That's one example of, of this kind of um, new data that's, aggregate, uh, that's being created and, and kind of assembling out there. Um, another example um, looks at how I want to show you how some of these, um, some of these same powers of um, faster storage, faster, uh, better, better processing, and sensors are pushing prices down and creating new data where data hadn't existed before. An ECG machine, right? So, so anybody, any hospital clinic, um, any hospital has, has probably dozens of these things. Um, this is what uh, Google tells me one costs. Um, $4,000 is probably a little high these days. They're, they're, they come for cheaper, certainly. But, but this one, um, maybe some of you know that the Schiller is the best model possible. Um, anyway, so $4,000. Well, well, consider this. Uh, there is now a, an app um, that, with a little attachment, um, has dropped the price of gathering that data to less than $100. Um, this is, I should say, pending FDA approval. Um, the, it's been approved in Europe. Um, but imagine this. It's, it's dropped at least in one order of magnitude. The same data, same quality of data being um, you can now gather uh, on an iPad. Um, and all of a sudden, you're entering this environment where, where there's a lot more data that's going to come on in, into your hospitals, a lot more data coming into doctor's clinics because it's so cheap. It's so easy to get that measurement. And it's a very routine measurement. Um, obviously, the, the information in ECG is, is not something like an MRI or a, or a CT scan. But it's a significant and important piece of data that, that all of a sudden is so much cheaper to gather that what are we going to do with that data? What are you going to do with that data when you start getting it for, on any patient almost in a real-time basis? And it actually goes even further. There's a 99-cent app um, that's called Instant Heart Rate, and it uses, going back to this idea of sensors, it uses the, um, the light sensor on the back of the iPhone. And even though that light sensor is supposed to, uh, is put into the Apple, put it in there so it can detect when um, the flash should go off when you're taking a picture, what these clever fellows at this, um, at this startup have decided is they've realized was that if you put your finger over that light sensor, the sensor can see how fast the blood is moving through your finger, and that can give you an accurate sense of your heart rate. And so for 99 cents, any of us can get an accurate heart rate measurement at any time. Again, data starts to come online where it never existed before. It's 99 cents instead of $4,000. So that's a sense of the new data. That's this profusion of new data that's coming into healthcare. Um, somebody's going to need to know what to do with it. Somebody's going to need to know uh, how, to, how to channel that into uh, actionable knowledge. But there's this other part of the data uh, continuum. Um, now, I, I call it lazy data here. I, I used to call it latent data. Um, but a couple of weeks ago, I was speaking at um, the Health Data Initiative at, um, at, uh, in Washington, DC. And I, I, was, I had the uh, pleasure of speaking before um, uh, Secretary Sebelius of HHS. And I called it latent data, and, and um, then and I finished my remarks. And then uh, Secretary Sebelius came on the stage, and she uh, 
thankfully was quoting from me, um, but she called it lazy data. She, she misheard me. Um, and so rather than correct the Secretary of Health and Human Services, I'm going with her coinage. <laughs> it's now lazy data, um, which is actually a better term because what I was talking about in, in terms of lazy data is all the data that already exists in your hospitals, all the data that already exists in our healthcare system, but we're not putting it to work. There is a huge amount of data that we can start to look at because of these opportunities, because of these technologies that are coming online. Again, Archie Cochran would be thrilled at the amount of data that we have, and he would be chagrined at how lazy we're being with it. So let's think about it. Actually, if I, if I have time, I want to go through an example of, of um, uh, kind of, a, a, to me, one of the best examples of, of um, turning the, the uh, light on this lazy data. It, it's a... Um, it's a public hospital from, from the 50s where this uh, sister, Sister Jay Ward, um, was in charge of the uh, newborn unit. Um, it was Roachford Hospital in, in Essex, England. And Sister Ward had this habit or this, this belief that when um, a jaundiced baby was brought into her uh, unit, um, that giving it some fresh air and getting, taking it onto the sun would actually clear the jaundice. It, it was her experience that when she would walk around with, with um, the kids for a few minutes or half an hour, take a walk around the grounds, um, that the jaundice would actually clear. And so she was doing this for a couple of years. And finally, one of the doctors in the unit uh, noticed that she was, because the doc, they actually didn't like the, the nurses to take the babies out of the hospital um, uh, and walk around with them. So, so one of the doctors noticed, and she said, well, well look at this baby. Um, and she showed how the jaundice had cleared from the entire baby except for a, a little patch where the blanket was over the belly. And so there was a clear yellow area um, where the rest of the skin was, was um, clear. And so this doctor, rather than, rather than um, chastise or reprimand um, Sister Ward, he decided that he was going to uh, perform an experiment. So he followed in, in uh, Archie Cochran's footsteps and he started to analyze whether uh, light um, and he started to use uh, uh, ultraviolet or um, um, fluorescent lights, uh, whether that would actually improve jaundice. And lo and behold, it did, right? It was, it was flushing the bilirubin, breaking down the bilirubin from the system. Um, and, of, and at the time, the jaundice babies, it was, it was a, a very um, kind of common way of having slight retardation, right? So, so the bilirubin would build up in the system and it would, it would actually affect the brain. Um, and so, so if you couldn't, clear the jaundice, uh, you, would have, you would have a slightly retarded uh, child. So this experiment happened, and in 1958, he published the results in uh, The Lancet. Uh, so it was a great win, right? She observed something, they conducted an experiment, and, and it was published in The Lancet. So you think, all of a sudden, care changes, right? Well, actually, nothing happened. No, care did not change for 10 more years, not until an American experiment um, was conducted doing the same basic uh, experiment, exposing kids to fluorescent light. And in 1968, that, the results of that experiment were published in the journal Pediatrics. So think about this. It took, it took and it wasn't until another five years after that that it actually started to change um, uh, kind of clear care guidelines in, in most hospitals in the United States and, and England and, and elsewhere. So you have a span of almost 20 years from Sister Ward observing something, observing that something has a positive effect, to it being measured and proven and published, and then published again, and then finally care starts changing. So you have a generation of kids who are being kind of exposed to this, this possibility of having low levels of retardation, and a generation of kids who nonetheless or inevitably have that effect, right? Even though the knowledge existed, that's what I call lazy data. That's what I call having information in the system where we're not taking advantage of it. And that's, that's, kind of, that's just one example out of, out of a profusion in the history of medicine, right? But, but that is a tragic circumstance, and certainly we can get better at using data now than we did then. Except, if you look at a recent Institute of Medicine report from a decade ago, they showed that the average time it takes for um, thing, a, a published result, a clear uh, publishable result that would affect care get guidelines to actually work its way into the clinic. The lag from, from finding to care change, a, a ch change in practice, was 17 years. 
That was published in 2000. So 50 years after this, we're still in this cycle of waiting almost an entire generation before we start to act. I think, I think, I really hope that technology, the technologies we have available to us can shrink that, can get rid of that gap, can get rid of that lag, and start putting some of this lazy data to work. I, I had this, I looked into this myself because um, when, when I, we had our second kid, not Rex, but our other kid, I, don't, I didn't know I was gonna tell you my family story. Um, but, uh, but our other kid, Buck, was born with a slight case of jaundice. And so he went into, the, the, when he, uh, the, the day he was born, we just wanted to get out of the hospital and go home. And the nurses said, oh no, you have to go and, and have this light therapy, phototherapy for, for 24 hours. And I was annoyed, right? My reaction was annoyance. This was just at UCSF, um, a, a, a quasi-public hospital. Um, uh, uh, and the fact that I was annoyed at this, at being required to give this, this routine piece of care which 30 years ago, when I was, when I was born in 68, was, was, was radical, a radical treatment, right? And kids were not, um, that treatment was not available to children. I just find that amazing. And so, so for me, that's, that was one of the, one of the kind of um, informing things that, that made me really think about what can we do with lazy data? What can we start to do and how can we start shifting? So I wanted to, to finish up here with a few examples of, of um, different tools, different um, uh, services that I think are, are taking some of this lazy data and putting it into a form that, that actually might be relevant for, for some of your institutions. Um, just four, four services, one is, um, and I, just to be clear, I have no interest in any of these things, um, though I know a couple of the people um, involved here or there. So one is this great um, nonprofit here, based here in the Bay Area called the Healthy Communities Institute. And what they're doing is they're taking publicly available data and they're uh, putting it into infrastructure, or into, um, uh, uh, kind of displays where people can target community data along specific health um, purposes. And I'm sorry this is unreadable, um, but these are all, this is just a list of different um, uh, care issues. And this one in particular is for obesity. So, so for Pasadena, this has been customized for the uh, community of Pasadena, California. Um, they have a moderate uh, rate of obesity. That's the, that's the uh, kind of dial up there. And um, they just are just basically pulling in the metrics from publicly available databases and uh, representing it in a form that is relevant to the health providers in this community, um, many of whom would probably be uh, public hospitals. So this is a, a service that, that can be, um, tailor, can be um, customized, localized for all sorts of communities around the um, country. Uh, they're up in about 20, 25 states right now. Um, and it's this amazing synthesis of publicly available data in a form, uh, in an environment, in a design environment that is actually useful, right? So it's taking the, the, uh, the data that was just sitting in some um, government database someplace and it's making it actionable and, and relevant. Uh, it's turning it into, in fact, a feedback loop. So that's the first one. The second one is Stratasan, which um, if anybody actually has heard about these, please just mention it, because I'd, I'd be curious if, if any of you are using these services. Um, Stratasan is a, is a uh, uh, by kind of uh, core purposes, mapping. Um, what they offer are things like this. They offer um, analytics that let hospitals um, understand, go use their own um, billing databases to understand where are the patients that they're serving and what are, the, what are some of the demographics of, those, um, of that patient community. And so here's an example of uh, 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 hospital called Brentwood Medical Center, and you can understand um, the farther, this makes sense, but the farther away, the, the, uh, this is showing the patient volume. So the closer um, patients are in the dark red, and then the um, uh, less frequent patients are in the pink. Um, but they also have let you break down um, the, uh, the revenue that you're getting from those patients by uh, funding source. So Medicare, Medicaid um, are those, are those um, blue and light blue. Uh, dots, and you're able to see how much each individual patient is bringing into the hospital in terms of revenue. Um, so using the latent data, the lazy data that existed in the, in, the company, in the hospital's billing database, and all of a sudden visualizing it in a way that lets them make probably better care decisions, care decisions on how they want to interact with their community, care decisions in what kind of outreach they may want to be doing, um, all, sorts of, all sorts of things that you guys can probably imagine um, way better than I. So uh, the next one 
that I want to mention is Indigo. And Indigo stands for Individualized Guidelines and Outcomes. And this is a, a product that's um, a spin-off of um, this company called Archimedes, which is actually just, just down the street here. Um, Archimedes was founded by David Eddy, which um, maybe some of you have heard of David Eddy. He's the fellow who really took up the baton from um, Archie Cochran. And David Eddy actually coined the term evidence-based medicine. And uh, he was doing a lot of uh, academic uh, research uh, and kind of de developing that research or developing that evidence for, for several years. And then um, in the, uh, over the last uh, 10, 15 years, he developed this tool called Archimedes, which is a, uh, basically a synthesis of a, a medical model which will allow patients, allow um, uh, uh, companies, they, it's, contract, it's a unit of Kaiser, so it helps um, organizations see uh, what is the, what is the uh, trajectory of different care practices. Um, and that's, it's all uh, a model, uh, a computer model. Indigo takes it a step further, and what they're doing is they're, they're sucking out the patient data uh, from a, an institution, anonymizing it, but then um, looking for patterns in the patients, in the patient's trajectories, in the patient's um, care needs, and delivering back um, forms like this. This is an example from uh, Boston Health Group, which, which uh, is a client of Indigo. And this is what the care provider might see. It's a breakdown of um, one patient's um, uh, potential risks for heart disease, um, uh, diabetes, other conditions. And then they also have this other screen that um, the physician is, is uh, encouraged to share with the patient that shows uh, on an annual or on a future projection what is the patient's risk of developing heart disease um, or having, a, in a sense, uh, having a heart attack depending on various care measures. So if the patient takes, uh, starts taking a beta blocker, um, they might have that dark blue line. If they start to take um, daily aspirin and a beta blocker, it might be that light blue line. Um, uh, it's, it's a way to help the patient understand what are their, how are their choices affecting their path forward. And it's an incredibly powerful feedback loop. When you start to give patients information like this, it changes the way they engage with their health profoundly. It's, it's in fact one of the best ways to get people to change their behavior is to show them how their specific path forward might play out. Um, so it's a, it's a fascinating product and I think an area where you're combining the population data, you're combining the population data that, that everybody has in their EHR, but you're pulling out the individual patterns um, that, are, that are personalized. And again, going back to the idea of personalized medicine, that's powerful personalized medicine right there, and it's something that, that really any institution can start providing. Another one, the last one that I want to show you is this one called M Health Coach. Uh, it is um, a, a service that uh, basically helps um, care providers uh, tailor the, um, do, do better follow-up with their patients. So in this case, this is a, a simple electronic pill card that the um, care provider will fill out for the patient, and it tells them how often they're supposed to be taking their pills and why. Um, and then what they do is they go onto the, uh, there's a little mobile app that the patients will have, um, and it basically lets the patient log the behavior that they're supposed to be doing. Um, in this case, for, for something like a urinary tract infection, it can, it can um, help them uh, monitor how often they're going to the bathroom. Um, there's all sorts of behaviors, all sorts of uh, uh, kind of care treatments plans that, that this tool offers. But it's a way of extending that kind of uh, uh, care environment into the home in a, in a way that doesn't involve this kind of future of medicine thing with, with kind of uh, fancy television screens where the doctor is talking to the patient. I've, I've seen that stuff for years and decades, right? And that stuff is never going to happen. This stuff is happening. It's happening right now. This is the same idea but it's using the technologies, it's leveraging off the, techno the scalable technologies, and it's bringing these services to people in a very real and, and manifesting way. So, that was called M Health Coach. So, so my point here is to, is to go back to, to the kind of principle of, of um, Archie Cochran. It's to, to use the data that we have to, to to, we, we sit in this area, you, all of you guys have these, or many of you probably have, have really quite innovative um, electronic health records. I know some of you are actually some of the first institutions to, to adopt electronic health records. 
All of that stuff is grist for these kind of, of applications. Um, there are Archie, Archie Cochran's in this room, right? If Archie Cochran could do that kind of experiment, if he could create that kind of information, create that kind of uh, intervention in a POW camp where he had such few resources and such poor support, imagine what we could do with the resources and the data that you guys have. One of the favorite things that um, Archie Cochran said at the end of his, his career was, was he was reflecting on this shift that he had helped um, perpetrate, moving to, to um, uh, uh, this kind of randomized control trial of randomized clinical trials, um, not just in labs, but in communities. He was talking about how, how um, making measurements of community outcomes were almost as good, um, or in fact, could just as be just as good as in a laboratory environment. And I think we're at this point where we're making the next shift. We've gone from laboratories to communities to epidemiology to real-time analytics, analytics of data that already exists in the system. That's a huge opportunity. So it's really just a matter of, of deciding to take action, deciding to do experiments, deciding to do pilot projects. Many of you are probably already doing these things. But if you're already doing them, then do a little bit more. Because this is the kind of opportunity that is going to change the way we, we provide care and is going to improve care. I've been talking a huge amount about data. I've been talking a huge amount about, I've been showing charts and graphs and things like that. And at some point, at some point soon, this needs to move away from data. And it needs to be not about the data. It, it, I mean, it, it actually is happening now. Um, it's about the care, right? It's about using the resources that we have to provide better care and create better outcomes. Data is the vehicle. It's the back end, but it's not the thing that's actually going to change people's lives. Better care is going to change people's lives. And that's what Archie Cochran was on, too. And that's what all of you are on, too, as well. Thank you very much for your time. So we have, we have a few time for questions. I know, I know I'm, it's, it's this and then the end of the conference, so I won't be insulted if you decide to end the conference. But, um, but I'm happy to take questions. I'm happy to hear about anything that you guys might be doing along these lines already. I, I, I would love to, uh, love to get some um, insights from those of you who are trying to do these things um, or have opted not to. Or we can just conclude the conference. Oh, there is one. This is actually not a question. My name is Steve Phelps from Ventura County Medical Center. Yesterday, we, uh, our speaker, uh, Dr. Berg, is also an author. Uh, comment on something called democratization of uh, medical information. We, we sort of live in a brave new world now, especially with uh, up to date for those hospitals and, and clinic systems that use it. Um, and I'm, I'm going to give you an example um, and also a kind of a clarification, I think, on the lazy data that we collect as a system. Um, I'm a hospitalist, so I take care of patients at a county hospital. And uh, some of the conditions that we see include something uh, along the lines of what's called alcoholic hepatitis, which is essentially, if you've seen Living, uh, living in, um, I think it was Leaving Las Vegas, was a movie a few years ago. Uh, if you drink enough alcohol, essentially you can put yourself into subfulminant liver failure. And you turn yellow and essentially you die eventually, or about 50% of those people die within several months. A few years ago, there was a randomized controlled study that came out of Calcutta out of, uh, in India at a uh, public hospital where they essentially took alcoholic patients who came in, a lot of whom were homeless, and put them in a, two different uh, groups. And they basically did a study that we can't do in the United States, which is essentially put people on uh, Trental or mm -hmm. steroids to see if uh, what group did better. And the um, group that did better was the group that, did, uh, that used pentoxifen or Trental. And, um, you know, within three months of that study coming out, um, that information was disseminated around the world. And I was already starting to move in that direction after that journal article came up. And so things like Pub, PubMed, UpToDate, have changed the practice of medicine on the ground in terms of how quickly information is disseminated around the world. If you had told me that I was going to change my practice based on a randomized controlled study in Calcutta, I would have been like, you know, what are you talking about? <laughs> but um, Information at the physician level changes quickly. I think what a good example actually of what's, what I would, would you coined as lazy data 
is the collection of information that we collect around the, uh, around the world in healthcare that doesn't really necessarily correlate with improved patient outcomes or is used in a way to help with that. And for example, 95% uh, in this country, 95% of prescription data is collected in a, in a massive, you know, multiple databases. And, um, you know, one of the questions that physicians always encounter is, you know, is my patient taking their medications like they're supposed to? Mm -hmm. And 95% of that data is actually collected, and, you, you know, but we don't necessarily do that, anything with that information. I mean, just within the last two or three years, private insurance companies have actually been analyzing data, and if you're a physician who has patients with Cigna or some other healthcare insurance, you'll get a letter and say, hey, your patient who has diabetes is only taken you know, has only filled their prescription three times in the last six months. What's wrong with this? We don't have that instantaneous feedback. And that's what I consider lazy data, is that you, you as a physician can know the next time you see your, your patient, hey, this patient only filled their prescription five times in the last six months, so something's not right here. And maybe that explains my, your, you know, why your diabetes measurement of your hemoglobin A1C is, you know, 10% and pretty lousy. And that's the kind of information that we need as physicians to impact change. And, and, we, and we need innovation to have that communication between all of these sort of databases, because that's truly lazy data that's being collected right now, and it's not, you know, not being used prospectively in terms of improving healthcare. Right. So. I, I think that's, uh, those are two great um, examples. I love, the, I love the India example, and I love the, the example of um, how how hard it is. I think I think in both cases, my comment would be, um, I'm not trying to say that this is you guys have an easy job. You have there's a profusion of information. All this data, you guys are probably swamped with data. Um, what I want to what I want to go back to is that 17 that that lag that 17 year lag. Um, those those. 30 years where, where Archie Cochran was, was trying to get people to do randomized clinical trials before they really took root. Those, that 20 years that it's been um, uh, for uh, the uh, Billy Rubin uh, finding to actually become, work its way into practice. Um, an example of that changing rapidly is your Calcutta example. An example of, uh, but at the, other, at the other side, there's all these people who, Many of you probably who who feel like, you know, it's so messy. I don't want to. I want to wait till it all settles out. I want to wait till this gets sorted out and the tools are clear and the way I bring this into my organization is clear. And and once once somebody else has figured it out, then I'll adopt it. Well, I just want to impress on on you how how that is might be easier in the short term, but you're missing a huge opportunity to. Close that gap and to change people's lives now. It's it's going to be messy. It's going to take trial and error. It's going. It's an, rather. It's it's a it's a an experiment about experiments. But the tools are here. The infrastructure is here, and there are now the companies um, that are not necessarily the same companies that are, are health uh, traditional. The Epics, the the traditional EHR providers, those kind of um, companies. These are these are people who are looking to uh, try to change healthcare very quickly and they want to work with you guys to to do that and and to me that's that's uh it's going to be messy but it's also an opportunity to shrink that that generation of change to to one of yours so i'm glad you're i'm glad you're doing it with the calcutta thing that that is really amazing anybody else all right well thank you all i really appreciate your time <laughs>